stop me if you've heard this one before. This is the most important election of our lifetime. This is the most important election of our times. This is the most important election in our lifetime. Politicians say every time, oh, this is the most important election. This one's really that important. There'll be a time to stand on principle later, but this time we just have to win. The stakes are too high, and if the other side prevails, it may well be the end of our country as we know it. If this kind of language sounds familiar, it's because it's routinely trotted out at every election cycle in the hopes of scaring people into voting the right way. Recently, The Atlantic magazine ran a special issue entitled If Trump Wins, entirely devoted to articles speculating about what would happen if the former president manages to secure a second term in November. The predictions range from pessimistic to apocalyptic. According to more than a dozen featured authors, a Trump victory would result in everything from the end of civil rights and the destruction of the climate to the end of American democracy, or even a military dictatorship. Meanwhile, more than half of voters surveyed in a Harvard poll believe that if elected, Trump will behave like a dictator. We have no way of knowing whether any of these predictions will actually come true, but one thing is clear. The media wants you to be afraid. Very afraid. Of course, this is nothing new. Though not as extreme, there was a certain hysteria around the election of Barack Obama, who some conservatives believed would transform America into something resembling the Soviet Union or Communist China. George W. Bush's victory in 2004 was considered to many to be the worst thing that had ever happened to the country, and this is just within my lifetime. In the famously divisive election of 1800, supporters of John Adams claimed that a Thomas Jefferson presidency would result in a nation where murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will openly be taught and practiced. Hyperbolic rhetoric has always been part of the campaign process, but it's easy to understand what can occur when we take these attacks on candidates too seriously. For one thing, the way our election system is structured allows this kind of fear-mongering to entrench the established political parties and limit the choices of American voters. According to Pew Research, only 41% of Americans have a favorable view of the Democratic Party, while just 37% approve of the Republican Party. Meanwhile, 71% of voters say they wish they had more than one party to choose from. But there are, in fact, plenty of third parties that we could vote for if we wanted to, including the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, the Constitution Party, or third party candidates like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. One of the reasons why these minority parties failed to gain traction, however, is that people are too busy voting against what they fear rather than voting for what they actually want. So while plenty of Americans may support Libertarians or Green Party ideas, they are constantly warned that it's better to choose the lesser of two evils than to throw away your vote on something better. This year, we're witnessing a new escalation in election fear-mongering, as the Supreme Court of Colorado and the Attorney General of Maine are attempting to legally prevent Donald Trump from appearing on ballots in their states, claiming that he participated in an insurrection. Now, these efforts have not stood up in court, but it's deeply troubling development that could lead to a political arms race, in which the incumbent party consistently tries to prevent their opponents from even running. The irony is that the ones shouting loudest about the threats to democracy posed by a Trump presidency are the same ones trying to limit who Americans are allowed to vote for. The same Democrats that will tell you that Trump's election will be the end of democracy are the same ones that are trying to keep Robert F. Kennedy off the ballot. Letting eligibility for office become a political football can hardly be a good sign for the health of our nation. But at a more fundamental level, the amount of hysteria over who becomes the president is tearing holes in the social fabric of America. Each year, dozens of think pieces are written bemoaning the increased polarization and hyperpartisanship of Democrats and Republicans. Yet the cause of this division is easy enough to understand when every election is presented as an existential threat, whether to your livelihood, your civil rights, the planet, or your very life. It used to be the case that Democrats and Republicans could disagree on trade policy or tax cuts while still remaining friends. Now we're told that any vote for an opposing candidate is an attack on our very right to exist. It's hard to be friends with someone whom the media portrays as supporting an evil tyrant. Of course, the media, corporate and governmental establishments have a vested interest in perpetuating conflict among us. Hot button issues like abortion, January 6th, and the so-called end of democracy. The second Trump term could mean the end of American democracy as we know it. Are constantly highlighted to keep us divided and distracted from the reality that both major political parties are fundamentally similar. Despite presenting themselves as distinct entities with different agendas, 
They both ultimately support an endless state of war and a corrupt, bloated bureaucracy. The system favors special interests such as big pharma, agribusiness, big oil, Wall Street, big tech, and major defense contractors over the needs of the average working and taxpaying American. We fund a sprawling deep state that orchestrates wars and regime changes worldwide, largely covertly, with only occasional revelations by whistleblowers. Figures like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange have been forced to flee the country, facing imprisonment for the crime of informing the public about our government's actions. Actions which primarily offend a deep state accustomed to operating in secrecy. Thus, the government and corporate media establishment maintain this cycle of internal conflict among us, diverting attention away from the fact that we essentially live in an oligarchy. In this system, it's not each other we should be wary of, but rather the deceptive practices of our two-party duopoly. Of course, it's always possible that this time the fear-mongers have a right. The next Hitler or Stalin could be right around the corner, and that's what makes the tactic of scaring voters so effective. But America survived Thomas Jefferson, it survived George W. Bush and Barack Obama, it even survived Donald Trump. For two and a half centuries, this grand experiment in democracy has endured a civil war, a Great Depression, two world wars, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Since when have we become so convinced of the fragility of our society that we think one election can end it all? As we navigate through the political landscape of 2024, it's essential to remember that the real challenges we face stem from an oligarchic system masked as a two-party democracy. The system thrives on keeping us embroiled in conflict with each other, distracting us from the larger issues at hand. However, if we truly want to protect our country, our traditions, our institutions, and our relationships, we must do so with hope and perseverance. The real threat to America is not a single politician or party, but our collective succumbing to pessimism and division. In recognizing this, we must focus on what unites us and work toward a future filled with hope, a future for our children and grandchildren. Let's approach this election with a renewed sense of purpose and unity. Let's remember it's only an election, but our response to it will define our nation's path.